Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Natural History Museum. Welcome to Nature Live. My name is Alistair. I will be your host for this afternoon's show. Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, before we start, hands up if this is your first time coming to a Nature Live talk. A few first timers, but a few people have been before, which is great. So if this is uh, second time coming, thanks for coming back. Hope you enjoy it. Um, for those that haven't been here before, let me tell you uh, very briefly what Nature Live is all about. Now, uh, if you managed to get around all of the galleries and all of the exhibitions today, uh, you'd have done pretty well, actually. There's an awful lot there. You'd probably be quite tired by the end of that. But you would only have seen a very small part of the museum. Most of our collections are actually tucked away behind the scenes. But they're not just stored away gathering dust. They are a resource used by by scientists, historians, and artists from all over the world who come to the museum to use this collection in their own research. And Nature Live is an opportunity for you to see bits of the collection that normally are tucked away and to meet the people that work with them. And I'm delighted to introduce you today to a guest speaker with us. Uh, this is Matt Bevis from Oxford University. Thanks Hello. very much, Matt, for coming along today. Pleasure. And uh, Matt is going to be talking to us about uh, the artist Edward Lear. And uh, we're going to be exploring some of the incredible work that Lear produced uh, in a very uh, prolific uh, life of art. And uh, in mentioning what we bring out from the collection, we brought along one of Lear's books today. We've got it at the front here. It's a magnificent uh, volume of parrot illustrations. And uh, calling them parrot illustrations actually seems to be selling it a bit short. Um, these are some of the most remarkable pictures uh, of birds that I've ever seen from any artist. But uh, Matt here is, uh, is the expert in, uh, in all things Lear, so he's going to be talking to us about uh, what was going on with these wonderful illustrations. If you have any questions for Matt, uh, it's very relaxed and formal. So if you've got a question, just pop your hand up and we'll take it as we go. Uh, or alternatively, if you prefer, at the end of the talk in about 25, 30 minutes, you are very welcome to come down to the front and uh, speak to Matt personally. And also, I would encourage you to get a closer look at the illustrations in the book as well, because they're absolutely stunning. All right. Well, uh, Matt, before we, we start exploring uh, Edward Lear, can you tell us a little yeah. bit about yourself? Uh, you know, wh what's your sort of uh, research interests and, uh, and your role? Sure, yeah. So I'm based... Um in the English faculty at Oxford, S um, so I'm I'm really a literary critic by trade, uh, and hence part of my interest in Lear. So I work on 19th and 20th century literature and culture, um, increasingly on poetry. Yeah. Excellent. So, just uh, out of interest, hands up those of you who are familiar with Edward Lear. Who's heard of him? Okay, ha keep your hand up if you're familiar with him through his poetry work. Okay, that's quite a few people, because of course, he's most people, if they know of him, have probably heard of his nonsense poems, haven't yeah. they? His, his, uh, yeah. His sort of children's rhymes and stuff, yeah. very, very popular. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, I mean, 1846 is an interesting way to start. That's the year he publishes the nonsense verse, uh, or the, the first collection of nonsense, but it's also an interesting year for him for reasons that are less known now. Um, it, so it might surprise you to know that in June of that year, he's giving Queen Victoria drawing lessons. Uh, he's publishing, in the same years he publishes The Nonsense, he publishes a book uh, called Illustrated Excursions into Italy and another book of natural history illustrations. So there's a sort of another side to Leah. Um, the yeah. I'm just popping yeah. up a few of these as you're as you're talking there. Yeah. I always, I love limerick. They're my favourite kind of poetry. I'm going to say right. That, yeah. That's um, good. And uh, we'll we'll come on to that. And uh, I think what's so interesting to me about Lear is that he seems to be this sort of unusual figure of an incredible artist, but he has this wonderful sense of humour and and it's coming mm. across in, in you know to mm. be able to produce pieces of art like this in this book but also to produce something like these wonderful little nonsense poems is quite yeah, remarkable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the reasons I was drawn to Lear, I mean, most, uh, probably like those of you who know him, I first knew him as a child. Um, and increasingly, that when I started, I started rereading him again when I became a parent <laughs> and f feeling in that there was another sort of side to him in the nonsense verse, as well as just the range of private and public stories around him. Um, it's... Lear once said um, that life is something that we suffer from first and then laugh at afterwards. And um, the more I got to know about his private life, the more that seemed to inflect or inform the strangeness of the poems. 
Um, is it worth saying something just a bit of background about Lear as a, his, his childhood? And um, yes, briefly, because mm. I think that's yeah. going to say a lot about what he went on to do. Yeah, um, so he was born, he was the 16th of 17 children. He was born in 1812 in London. Um, he was born with, he had chronically short sight, so his childhood was very difficult, to put it mildly. His, his father went bankrupt when he was four. Um, he was then given over to the care of his eldest sister. Um, he suffered from bronchitis, from asthma, and crucially from epilepsy, uh, which was something that he kept a secret for the, for the rest of his life. He never married. Um, the, the social stigma around epilepsy was incredibly strong then. Um, so he also said that from the age of four onwards, he remembered suffering what he called uh, the morbids, so prolonged periods of depression. Um, so the, the childhood is marked by a broken home. He left home very early. He lived with his sister. Uh, and again, these things can perhaps be felt in, in, in the writing. Excellent. Um, well, before, um, before he started writing his, his famous nonsense poems, he had uh, an incredible early career in natural history. Um, could yeah. you tell us a little bit about the work that he did uh, as we have a look at some of the, the artwork? Yeah, um, I mean, if we turn to the, the Parrot book is, the, is a, a kind of astonishing achievement on, e on every level. He published it when he was 18 years old. He'd had no institutional support or training. Um, and within the, uh, the day after he was, it was published, he, he was elected to be a member of the Linnean Society. Uh, the Parrot book is sort of astonishing for lots of reasons. Um, it's one of the first books that opted for the size. You see this much larger folio size um, that you see. Um, it was one of, Lear was one of the first artists to paint when he could from live specimens rather than stuffed specimens. Um, you can see that. You can sometimes see the distinction. If you click, do we have a comparison between... And I not, don't think yeah. so, but you can see the detail. Is yeah, the, is the detail of that. Really also, he started. He was using a form, um, a technique called uh, lithography, which gives an incredible richness to the to the the plumage. Um, and it was also one of the very first books that was devoted to a single family of uh, of birds. So, so what was it about? So, um, David Attenborough is uh, a great admirer of Edward Lear's work, mm. and in fact, collects the, a lot of the the images. Yeah, and he's described Lear as being the finest bird artist that ever lived. Yeah, what do you think uh, is it about Lear's work that makes it so distinctive? Yes, that's a good, really good question. I think well. Attenborough points out that one of the things that these drawings were meant to do, or, the, or their primary function, was to establish um, types for, for, for scientists. And I think one of the, th the things that comes across in Lear's birds is that they're always scientifically accurate, but they, you always feel that the birds are more than a type. They're, they're, they have, um, they're not merely exhibits, they're kind of exhibitionists when you look at his birds. They've got a little um, bit of personality yeah, in, in the way they're, they're yeah. painted. Yeah, and they also, I think, give you the strange feeling um, of the fact, you might think that they're designed for spectatorship, for your spectatorial delic uh, sort of delectation, but you get the feeling that the birds are also really looking back at you. Uh, there's an early caricature where he's, pr this is, so he paints these birds, or starts sketching them from inside the zoological uh, gardens. But here's an e early sketch where you see again, he's, he's as much interested in the way in which the bird may or may not be judging you <laughs> as you are in um, being a connoisseur of it. Um, Were these Lear's favourite birds? Because he certainly, yeah. you know, to produce a book like this, they must have been his favourites. Right? They are. He says at one in an early letter, parrots are my favourite. Um, and in fact, the earliest drawing that we have of Lear, or a, a self-portrait, if, if um, we can find that, is this one, yeah, <laughs> from a letter which, so he sort of comes into birth pictorially with a parrot on his head. Um, he says in one letter um, to a friend, I've been, I've been the last 12 months so obsessed with parrots that I think if I died now, I would turn into a parrot. 
So yeah, they're, they're in some way his first love, I think. I would say it almost go goes deeper than that because we've mm -hmm. got some illustrations here. Um, I'm going to pick this one up here. Where is this uh, a mm. portrait of Lear as a as a bird? Yeah, he exactly. Th there's lots of images of Lear um, um, as 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 a bird-like creature. He once said in a letter, "Verily, I'm an odd bird." Interestingly, "bird" in the 19th century, it, it, it's at that moment that the word can start to mean a sort of odd cove, funny old man, as well as 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 the other obvious meaning. But there's if if we there's a long tradition of um, Lear as uh, in flight or on, you know, living life on the wing, as it were. It's um, quite a plump bird he chose. Yes, to. <laughs> this is the older artist. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Um, I'm just going to bring up another couple of these, um, and I wonder if we can also get uh, the camera on the on the book that we've brought in, um, just so you can see. As I say, there will be a chance at the end to come down and, and look at it closely because it's the w the thing that really pops out of you when you look at these illustrations is the colour, I think, they're, they're yeah. so vibrant, yeah. considering how old some of these volumes are as well. Absolutely. This is particularly, uh, I mean, uh, this parrot eventually became named after Lear. It's identified as a, a hyacinthine macaw. It's actually um, an indigo macaw, unreliably informed, but um, it's yeah, it t it takes his his name. Uh, it was it was named after him in, in in tribute to him in in I think the middle of the nineteenth century. Um, yeah. So now I'm I would uh, I I mean I've I said to you before if if I could afford to to purchase a book like this I would absolutely have a copy myself because it's they're just such stunning illustrations and Lear produced this book to make money wasn't it it was it was it was a living for him he wanted it, to sell these ideally it was it was a as, um you know it was based on subscription but he had to abandon the project um it came the first set came out in 1830 but but the subscribe not all the subscribers paid up so um yeah it became uh he was then employed at nosley hall um for five years drawing uh lord darby's um Menagerie and Avery there. At that time, it was an, inc an incredible collection, the best in the country by far. Um, so he, he made his living uh, drawing uh, for Lord Derby after that. Now, I'm just going to bring up uh, this image here, which I think kind mm. of, to me, sort of nicely shows the his kind of approach almost that's sort of a work in progress can you talk us yeah through what's going this on i think this th so this is from the houghton archive at harvard but i i was pleased to come across this just to see the level of detail that go or the kind of mathematical precision that goes into <laughs> working out the uh the, the shape of the beak um and there's lots of drawings like this that, that there's something about i think this is another thing that attenborough is, uh touches on but there's a huge amount of spontaneity somehow combined with accuracy in these drawings. And there's sort of a miracle of putting those two things together. That, um, and it's a kind of incredible that he was able to produce that level of accuracy when, as he said, he wasn't working from stuffed taxidermy birds. He was, yeah. he'd be in the cage with the actual bird perched on a branch, yeah. uh, which presumably is, you know, moving around and flapping its wings mm -hmm. and doing all kinds of stuff, but he, he still managed to, yeah. to get that. He, does, he did have someone to hold the wings. I found out recently. Oh, really? Yeah, there was someone else in the cage that would hold wings at certain um, points. Um, yeah. Excellent. Now, you would have thought with a talent like this that he would have he would have had a long career uh, producing more and more of these wonderful illustrations, but mm. you said he, he had to abandon it. It, it. It's something that really only made up ultimately a very small part of his life. Yeah, it, it, it did. Um, although I think parrots haunted him. Um, there's the, the re one of the reasons it's worth sort of thinking about parrots and Lear is because I think for Lear they become they're one of his first s s alter egos in a way um, he has an early letter where he says um, poets like parrots talk nonsense I think one of the reasons that he's interested in parrots of course is and perhaps we're still interested in parrots is because they can talk in a certain way they can be taught to talk and nonsense for Lear whatever else it was was a kind of improper use of proper words it was a way of putting words in stra things that we're used to hearing in strange combinations and and parrots i think haunt our imagination and his imagination in the same way there's uh, his friend tennyson um 
has a, a, a not so much well it turns out to be a joke but it's about the family parrot in his own home where whenever they would sit down to pray the parrot would say oh god <laughs> which nicely captures the, the, the what's interesting that there's some the comical thing about parrots and also perhaps the sad thing about parrots for Leah is the ways in which they repeat our words to bring more than we thought they can more more out of them than we thought they contained. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's just we've you know, we've had a look at some of these nonsense points just at the beginning there. But if we come back to that, that mm. you mentioned how his a clear love of, of these animals starts to weave its way into into his work later on, mm. and uh, parrots uh, and birds generally feature in so much of this. Why was that? Why why was Lear wanting to include these animals in in his his poetry? Yeah, I think. Well, partly it goes back to the, the, the one of the things about parrots that ca I think whenever Lear thinks about parrots, as well as just thinking about their beauty and their intelligence, I think he also um, thinks about their entrapment. Parrots, after all, only talk in captivity. <laughs> they talk because we have wanted to make them do that. Um, and always in Lear, there's a sort of sense, a lot of Lear's limerick people are kind of trapped in lives they may or may not want to live. Uh, this, is, this is a useful way of sort of, this is part of a nonsense alphabet. So you have P was a poly, all red, blue and green, the most beautiful poly that ever was seen. P, poor little poly. The, now the, the catch there has to be poor. <laughs> why, why poor if so beautiful? And Q, perhaps gives you a, a hint at where Leah might be tending. Q was a quill made into a pen, but I do not know where and I cannot say when. Q, nice little quill. Behind this, I think, is a joke, or um, again, not a wholly funny joke about the ways in which birds may be rendered into implements that then are used to depict them. So he's always alert to what parrots are used for, and birds generally, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, Lear wasn't the only, only person at this time that was interested in birds. There are some huge figures of the scientific world that were uh, yeah. very interested in birds and yeah. bird behavior. Uh, um, people such as John Gould and, of course, Charles Darwin, yeah. uh, perhaps most, most famous of all. Mm. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the, the debates that were going on in the in this scientific community at that time yeah. and, and how Lear f Lear's ideas and, and work fed into that? Absolutely. It's worth saying, just as an aside, I mean, Lear worked for Gould on, on Gould's um, bird books. He also, uh, it's now felt, uh, contributed illustrations to Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle volume. We know also from records that Darwin consulted Lear's illustrations in the 40s and 50s. There's new evidence that suggests that even Darwin and Lear shared lodgings in the late 1830s. So there's sort of a hinterland so of possible potentially connection. Potentially quite close. Uh, yeah, period. we need to. F there's n more digging needs to be done there. But the, I, I mean, to go back to your question, that one of the central but birds, I suppose, are being used to think about humans in a in a serious as well as nonsensical way in this period, of course, because Darwin, there's the, the, the finches, obviously, famously, that helps to um, Darwin to think through natural selection. But in the, in the Origin of Species, he also starts to flirt with another idea, sexual selection. And he does that by thinking about bird behavior. So he points, uh, he looks at um, displays of uh, male birds displaying plumage, uh, and then the females then select the males. Uh, and I think this is a jolt to Victorian sensibilities or some Victorian sensibilities for two reasons. One is, it's Darwin's way of saying, well, aesthetic instincts may be sexual in nature. So high, high culture or, or the things that we might want to label instincts that are high, high culture uh, have other things going on inside them. And of course, what Darwin is also noting and sometimes shies away from is the fact that the women are doing the choosing in the animal kingdom. Uh, in fact, when he starts to turn to links between birds and humans, he quickly sort of reverses it and sort of says, well, ah, no, it's our women that are, I quote him, dressed in borrowed plumes and then the men do the selecting. 
So these kind of debates, the ways in which bird behaviour may or may not shed light on sexual politics, on why we make the decisions we make, is is somewhere in and about the nonsense, I think, and it can be sort of seen in its margins. Um, so there's some illustrations that we can we can look at here that 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 sort of touch on on this idea. So at a glance, this looks like a, a woman with a, a huge elaborate headdress which looks quite ridiculous but yeah there, you, I, there's I actually get, something behind this you know? yeah i think well again this is an early drawing but again it, it suggests that lear is is alert to um the the question of what plumage uh, in the animal in the human animal kingdom may or may not be doing is this woman i mean th the image makes her look almost trapped by the role rather than performing a role there's another um limerick which brings this out nicely Again, there was a young woman in red who carefully covered her head with a bonnet of leather and three lines of feather besides some long ribbons of red. Um, I mean, she's made deliberately hard to read in the, both the image and the text. Um, and again, there's possibly a sense in which the plumage is, it, sh that she's, um, when, when Darwin talks about the w women being, being dressed in borrowed plumes, there's a suggestion that they are typecast into certain roles as opposed to uh, displaying their own individualities, say. Um, so that's part of what the limericks, I think, are, if not quite stating, they're sort of circling in this area. And did, did Lear see his this the work that he was doing as being an important part of these debates that were happening uh, um, between people like Darwin. It's tricky. He would never say that explicitly. In a way, the the thing that Lear's famous for now, as we've been saying, is the nonsense. But it was the thing for him that was a sideline. It was the thing that he did when he didn't quite know what to do with his life. But there are interesting, I think, significances. So that Darwin's book on. Um, the Descent of Man, where he first properly airs sexual selection, spends a huge amount of time on birds, more than on mammals and humans combined, in fact. That comes out at the beginning of 1871. Lear's next nonsense book comes out at the end of the year and has twice as many characters who are bird or bird-like as his previous books. So again, I would want to argue that that's more than a coincidence, but it would take time to sketch in the possible um, trains of influence. So mm. um, the, the, the nonsense uh, poems are fantastic. I wanted to bring in this image here because mm. this is a slightly different kind of image, but in a way it, it's linked to what we've just seen in sort of cartoon form. But a lot of Victorian women would, would literally be dressing up in quite elaborate yeah. uh, dress uh, from bird plumage. Yeah, and this is, I think, is, a, is, is um, in a, some sense attempting to mock Darwin's readings. But So you have, again, I would, on the one on the right, the woman is, I would I were a bird. So there's a sort of sense in which, again, she's half entrapped by the roles that she's being forced to wear. Um, yeah. A fantastic illustration. It actually just reminds me of um, there was the whole issue of bird plumage uh, being used um, in fashion in Victorian times actually became quite contentious and uh, in the mm. early days of the museum, uh, the museum actually went uh, before Parliament um, to uh, try and uh, cut really stop the the very lucrative international trade in bird plumage because the museum was recognizing that actually a lot of these a lot of tropical birds with bright mm. bright colored plumage were actually on the verge of extinction yeah um and the museum actually recognized that stepped in to, to try and uh, and get a bill act that yeah would, that would lead to a ban in this kind of trade which it managed to do right um although yeah. i believe it clashed funnily enough with the um, the head of London Zoo at the time who didn't agree with that. So that was oh. an interesting kind of clash of, of yeah. big institutions there. Yeah. But, uh, you wouldn't see someone really dressed like this anymore. Uh, no. Probably in a, <laughs> it's a no. good thing. There's another, I mean, if we go to just another um, nonsense verse, there was an old man of Dunrose, a parrot seized hold of his nose. When he grew melancholy, they said, his name's Polly, which soothed that old man of Dunrose. Uh, this is a good example, I think, of the way in which Lear will um, parrot back words that uh, we would normally uh, understand perfectly with, with perfect ease. Um, Polly, of course, again, is, is Lear's way of alerting as to the fact that parrots are often effeminized in culture. 
Now that you know, they refer his name's Polly. So there's a sort of sense in which, um, if you read the line, when he grew melancholy, they said his name's Polly, which soothed that old man of Dunrose. There's a sort of complication. Who's the he there? Is it the bird or the man? Um, there's another uh, image, this one. Polly birdia singularis. And there you've got Leah punning on the word poly, which of course in Greek means many. So he's suggesting polybirdia singularis is what, again, Liz, we're taking up a word or a name that's been used to designate parrot, essence of parrot, and say, actually, it's multiple. Even the singular is weirdly fractured, can't be nailed down to a gender or a type. Um, yeah. I love these, uh, these illustrations. These, these are just three examples from an, a whole set, mm. uh, a botanical book of nonsense where he creates yeah. all these... Uh, these uh, funny-looking flowers uh, that clearly look like, as in this case, birds or, or pieces of, of furniture. Um, there's one thing that really winds me up. I don't know if any of you are any biologists in the audience, if, you, if this bothers you as well, but um, they've these made-up Latin names, um, the, uh, the second part of that should be all lowercase. That really winds me up. <laughs> he wants to be authentic. He should, singularis yeah. should not be capitalized. Oh, I blame the typesetter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, really imaginative. You can see th this stuff. Was he? W th was this stuff sort of appealing to kids at the time? Was this? Because mm. you know, you, you mentioned he yeah. was from a big family. He he did uh, seem to uh, love kids, and, and and a lot of what he produced would would be very popular among children. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's primarily written for them. But then th he can get defensive if. Um, people then th sort of imply that um, writing for children it need be any less complex than writing for anyone else. At one, in one letter uh, introduction, he says, oh, my, my poems are just Bosch, and then adds, not that Bosch doesn't require a great deal of care. And again, I think he's, from as we saw in the parrot sketches, he's no less interested in accuracy when he's dealing in nonsense than he is when he's dealing in scientific illustration. But it's a, he's, he's, all, he's playing around with the limits of accuracy. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's very easy, if I just go back briefly to some of the, his, his early work on the, on the parrots, you know, it's very easy to look at these and, and sort of admire them and, and talk about the huge importance they have mm. um, uh, in, in the world of science and, and natural history. And then it's very easy to then, to then click back and look at the nonsense poems and think, oh, well, he's just having a bit of fun there. But he was yeah. putting just as much care into it, uh, I just think in a different way. In, yeah, I mean, good examples of the, these two, where you see um, images, of, again, of <laughs> bird-like people looking at people like birds. There's a, he's really interested in returned gazes from the animal kingdom. I mean, another way of thinking about parrots is they're famous because they mimic. They mimic us. But they also remind us that we are mimics. <laughs> That's how we learn to speak. So there's a kind of cross way of thinking that, you, that, that rather than just condescending to the creature, there's ways in which I think Lear thinks that the creature puts us back in touch with. So it's interesting that in the 19th century, words that we, phrases that we take for granted, parrot fashion, parrot learning, parrot teaching, those phrases all come into being in Edward Lear's lifetime. He, yeah, it, it's it, funny actually. You don't really think about that, do we? we just those phrases are so common to us. Yeah, you think about where they came from. And they all de designate learning via imitation. We think it's funny when parrots do it, but I'm not quite sure how different we are from that from them in that respect. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, way of looking at it. Um, now we're just about out of time, but I ver finally I wanted to ask about um, one of Lear's sort of long lifelong ambitions as an yeah. artist. Uh, was to create landscapes, beautiful landscape paintings. Yeah. Um, and did he did he manage to achieve that? And did any of his early work on 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 birds and the nonsense work actually make its way in to landscape art? Good question. In a way, so th I think there's the his bird-like inclinations find its way their w its way into into his art, but in 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 unusual ways. So where bir even when birds disappear, you get images like this. He's interested in bird-like boats, things that he has in letters, descriptions of valleys where he says both sides of the valley look like wings as if they were about to take off. Many of Lear's landscapes have a kind of bent, of sort of V-shape in them. Um, he talks about, so he'll mark sometimes in the margins, raven, when actually it's a shorthand for ravine. 
Okay. So he plays around with nonsense in in the and if you turn to his this is his last drawing that he was ever working on. It this is a sketch from uh, he did it was it was incomplete when he died. Um but it it's of uh, a a poem by Tennyson's called Enoch Arden. But if you can't see it there, but if you now click close up to where Alistair's pointing, hidden <laughs> inside it's like a Where's Wally uh, yeah. picture, isn't it? It's a sort of harking back to his own beginnings. Uh, and it's worth saying, of course, that the, the first parrots that Lear ever saw were caged. They were exiled from home. Uh, and his last painting, in a way, I think is countenancing of sort of a, a version of, 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 a, of a parrot where it wants to be. In, in its natural, yeah. natural habitat. And very quickly, uh, I just want to point out, there's a figure down here. Is, yeah. is this Lear? It's actually, well, it's, it's, it's again, it's another one of his alter egos. It's Enoch Arden, the, 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 um, the, the figure that he's thinking about, looking, or, or a version of Robinson Crusoe, stuck on an island, wishing he were back home. But again, right next to him, bottom right, I don't know if you can point it, is another... It's like well camouflaged, really. Yeah. You've got to look scrutinised. Um, and of course, they needed to be well camouflaged because, of course, the other things we've been touching on, just that um, th you know the the dangers of extinction are becoming ever more more present. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you very much, Matt. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, but I would very much encourage you all, if you would uh, like to ask Matt any questions about what we've been talking about today, do come down and, and uh, feel free to ask, and uh, come and have a look at this. I yeah. think it's one of my favourite books now. Actually. It's amazing, um, yeah. These illustrations, we've seen the images on screen, but nothing beats seeing the, the real thing in the book as well. But uh, thank you so much, Matt, for Pleasure. talking to us today. Come on. Thank, thank you, thank for you coming. guys for coming. Do enjoy thank the rest you. of your day with us. Thank you.